Good evening, everyone, to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a special guest, Susan Gordon. Uh, she is best known in the UFO field as the drummer for the instrumental rock band UFAW with uh, Jim, Tell Jill uh, Jim Dilatoso on keyboards and Jerry Wills on bass. The uh, future band members at Tim Beckley's the future band members met at Tim Beckley's New Age and Alien Agenda Conference in Phoenix in September 1990, uh, Susan's first contactee lecture. Uh, an artist since childhood, Susan Paints, uh, paintings took on a mystical, esoteric quality after receiving messages from a tall, blue, benevolent race of extra extraterrestrial beings that began in 1988. Uh, Susan has been a professional equestrian since age 23, training horses for Olympic uh, disciplines and recreational riding. She also worked in advertising and had a boutique agency in Vancouver, BC, before the ET contacts became dominant in her life. Along with the UFO band, Susan lectured and demonstrated the language of angels at UFO and New Age conferences around the American Southwest. Her last 10 years there were spent in Sedona with UFO lawyer Peter Gersten. Uh, she is a top competitive master's runner, holding meet and age group records and distances on the track and up to the half marathon. She retains several equestrian clients and paints animal portraits and autographs. She teaches race walking and coaches the local running club in Salt, Salt Spring Island, B.C. Yep, you got it. <laughs> uh, Says so she is not lectured and rarely speaks in public since developing a voice condition in 2008 that affects the quality of her speech. Any anomalies in vocal tone that you hear are attributable to spasmodic dys dysphonia. If anything is unclear, please ask her to repeat words or remind her to take a breath. Uh, welcome to tonight's show, Susan. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm great, thanks. It's a gorgeous day here. And you are where? Salt Spring Island. It's uh, the west coast of British Columbia. Just, um, uh, I could say exotic Pacific Island, but it's not tropical. <laughs> uh, it's, how, how long have you been living in uh, Canada? Uh, since 2012, back, back home. And what brought you to Canada? Well, I was born here, but I spent over, gosh, 20 years in Arizona. So it's uh, so it was kind of like coming home. My parents had passed away, and um, that was kind of the catalyst. And uh, yeah, it was a series of events. And Peter, well, Peter was going to jump off Belt Rock into a portal. On December 21st, 2012, the winter solstice. And uh, so that kind of um, ended that relationship. So here I am. <laughs> Some of my clients, I had horse clients that had a house here on Salt Spring. They lived in Sedona, but they also had a house here. So that's how I ended up on Salt Spring. I came to a house it for them, um, which was going to be short term, but uh, I stayed for three and a half years and uh, met my current partner who lived uh, next door, and we've been together since. So I'm still here. <laughs> so you spent many years in Sedona, correct? Yes, 10. Okay. And when, uh, how old were you when your ET experiences started? How old? Yeah, well, okay, so even before you answer that question, yes. uh, what was the very first event in your life that was odd, strange, unusual, or paranormal, uh, or anything? Um, well, I had taken meditation classes and psychic empowerment. Uh, my business partner, Karen, we had a film production company in Vancouver. I was 28 
and I had um, left my advertising position with, uh, we did uh, shopping center advertising. I started a company with Karen. She had a friend who was a psychic and a teacher, and she did classes, so she wanted to use our office, uh, which we had a very cool office that was haunted. Um, and so she wanted to use it for these classes. So one of us had to be there. And I had always been kind of interested in psychic stuff and phenomena. So I decided to monitor the classes because we had to, well, one of the best partners um, had to be there to open the office. So as I took her classes, I learned how to meditate and became sensitive to auras. So the first incident happened during that course of time. Um, I would say it was a dream. I dreamt of a huge spacecraft that was wedge-shaped, not like saucer, but it was like kind of a pie-shaped with a um, second, uh, second layer, I guess is the way to describe it. It was huge, like they described it in the dream as, I think, oh, let's see if I can remember, 80, 89 kilometers long and about 60 wide at its widest, so quite big. Um, they described it as having like almost like a small city, uh, having agricultural and um, communication technologies that would serve humankind for a thousand years. So um, quite a strong uh, message for science, the environment, and um, I woke up and it kind of thought, well, what, what was that? <laughs> it was like a very lucid dream. And that was the first, the first of much to come. So yeah, that was the inciting incident, if you will. How old were you when you had that dream? How old? Uh, 28. And what year was that? 1988. I'm uh, 63. Okay, yeah. so... Um, Quite some time ago. What was your next... Uh, your, what was next your next one. experience? Well, the, I started... Let's see. I, can, I have notes. I, I actually started journaling at that time because I thought like, okay, this is so out of context for me. I had nothing to do with new age stuff. I wasn't into it. I had horses, horse clients, and an ad agency. Um, although my partner was kind of into crystals and stuff and obviously had this psychic friend. So out of curiosity, you know, this, but this business just like the lot of gates opened. Um, so everything, I was also um, raised Catholic, so I wasn't supposed to have interest in any of this stuff. But um, the next thing that happened right about that time, let's see what came first, I can't really recall, but my partner also had another psychic friend who was quite well known for consulting big business. So she did a reading for our business and she did a reading for us as individuals. And um, it was all it was kind of interesting, like just like regular stuff. But she asked if we had any questions at the end. Well, when I was 13, um, yeah, 13, this would be Calgary. Alberta. Uh, I used to see these bulbous headed beings in, in mirrors at night. They would watch me. And um, I didn't know what they were. I just didn't like them. So I used to block them from, I put a 
bookcase in between the mirror and my bed so that they couldn't watch me at night. And one night, a woman dressed in, um, well, she was, she was standing on a hillside in, as far as I could tell, Scotland. My um, dad's side of the family is from Scotland, a small town called Dufton. And this woman said, don't you ever step out of your body well, out of control even once or they will have you. And those were her exact words. So I took they to mean these creepy things in the mirrors and not to step outside of my body meant do not do drugs. So I have never touched a psychoactive drug ever. Alcohol, tiny little bits, but I don't drink at all. I just fall asleep. <laughs> it's like, um, so no substances, keep a clear head, basically. So those beings tracked me until I was 18. Then they finally disappeared. So stop for a second. Sure. Go back and describe the beings in the mirrors. The I would say they were the classic greys. Let me do a quick sketch and I'll show you exactly what they looked like. And you'll probably recognize them. Big heads, small necks. I'm just scribbling this out real quick as we talk. So here we go. Let's see if that works. Can you see that? Yes, I can see it. Okay. So that was the they even followed, like, once I got my driver's license, if I drove at night, I would look into my rear view mirror and I could see the darn things. <laughs> and it was like, yeah. So anyway, I was uh, happy to be warned about that. So that was back when I was 13. Now, once they went away, I just went on with um, my usual life. I had a job in advertising courses. I got, I actually married a born-again Christian who was a horse trainer. So that was like, those years were fine. Nothing to do with creepy things. Although there were some other hints that uh, strange esoteric things happened, like in, in and around me in my 20s, but I kind of ignored that. Anyway, um, back to 28 with this psychic that uh, was doing the business reading for it. So I asked her, I said, who was the woman who came to me and spoke when I was 13 and I had a dream and she said, do not step out of your body out of control. I said, I think it was someone from my dad's side of the family because she was from Scotland, as far as I could tell. That was where she was standing when she came to me in the dream and told me um, how to keep these beings under control. So this psychic woman, whose name was Pat, thought about it for a second. And she said, ah, she said that was your great-great-grandmother. Her name was Maggie, and she died young. She lived... Um, she gave me a time frame, like mid to late 18, about 200 years prior. And uh, so I thought, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. So I went home and uh, my parents and my dad had the old family Bible and um, registry, you know, those old Bibles that were this thick that came from European countries and with immigrants. So it had the birth steps and marriages of the Gordon family uh, dating back to the late 1700s. So I thought, well, if I see a Margaret who happens to fit that age range, I'll know that this probably was true. So I flipped through and I found uh, a Margaret, but she had died at one year old and I thought, well, that's not her. 
So I flip the next page and sure enough, there's Margaret Innes, my great, great grandmother, born and died in Dufferin, Scotland, born in 1820, I believe, um, and died if only like, gosh, I was quite young, not even 40. But um, so that was confirmation of that story. And I thought, well, all this stuff that I was told was, you know, satanic and evil and because you're Catholic, you know, you're not supposed to um, be interested or involved with any of this stuff. So I just went full bore. I started to study earth magic and driven crystal magic and everything that I wasn't supposed to take a look at, I did. And I kept going with these uh, meditation classes. And after that first spaceship dream, um, gosh, it just accelerated. There's uh, so many stories, but finally, uh, I was getting woken up with instructions at like four o'clock in the morning. And um, I started to have more details about uh, one of the underground bases. One of them was um, the homestead. I was actually, I was still married to my second husband at the time and I woke up and I said, where's Homestead? And, and uh, of course it's Florida, right? So Homestead, Florida. And I said, well, apparently I was there last night. There's an underground base and the U.S. has parts of spaceships and extraterrestrial beings. And like, <laughs> oh my God, like where is this coming from? So, um, and then they just started sending people and things started to happen, not in the dream state, not in the meditation state, because I said, well, if they can talk to me, maybe I can talk to them. And I said, please stop waking me up at four o'clock in the morning, because I'd get up at six o'clock to drive to work to my office. I often worked quite late. So, um, so they did. So I started to get uh, broad daylight instances where they'd say, well, we have a message for you. Pick up a pen and start writing. And sometimes I was, you know, I was in the middle of doing budgets or something. And I say, okay, so I start writing. So I still have those notes to this day because I thought, well, I'm not if they're going crazy or this stuff is going to be useful somewhere down the road because it was, they built the story. You know, it was like starting with kindergarten and hey, this exists and these exist and that exists and uh, you're not who you thought you were, but you know, here's kind of a gentle introduction to this whole phenomenon. So it was a whole trajectory over the course of two years. Finally, I just 24 seven contact for the most part. So how's that? Questions? Any questions? Uh, well, okay, so um, what um, of all the who was it that was contacting you? Who, who, who were the beings? There were several. Um, they said they they showed me a council, what they called the Galactian Council, and these were, I guess, see, I never, I didn't know these different types of beings or someone. Finally, someone came up and said something about Pleiadian, but I'm like, well, no, nothing ever introduced itself to me. They just said it as, as being from somewhere. And I think that was kind of a protection mechanism, um, which I can explain later. So um, it was just kind of like to keep the information from them very separate from anything that would come through other people or books or material. Um, so that what I knew was strictly what I was getting is down 
because I did not want to be influenced by other people or books saying, oh, that's Pleiadian, that's Andromedan, or whatever. So I kind of ignored, I didn't go running to bookstores and look up books on UFO contactees because I, I didn't know that that's what I was. Anyway, so um, they identified themselves kind of these, I guess you would call them, they were sort of like robed, uh, tall, elegant beings that said they were part of the council, the Galactian council, and uh, that I was part of this council. And um, then I was given two teachers. They were one foot, six foot eight, the other six foot ten. Um, they called themselves... Um, Actually, they didn't give me their names for quite some time. I eventually was given their names as Zahara and Shamwa. And I found out quite a few years later that Zahara is uh, the name of a sacred Tibetan mountain. And Shamwa is, uh, I believe it's Hebrew for to observe. So... Um, that was interesting that I did not get that translation for quite some time. So those were the main characters. And they sent me oh, on little missions. Well, actually, I insisted that because I was so busy with work, I said, look, if you guys are real, you better send me signs or people or things to prove it, or I'm going to ignore you, <laughs> you, whoever you are, and just go about my work because I was, you know, trying to build a fairly new business and working in media, you have deadlines and you've got, you know, I was running like big print productions and photo shoots and we had a grant to do a television series and so, you know, that's a lot of stuff a couple of people to manage. So um, I was not looking for any of this stuff, but it just kept coming. So, yeah, so those were the main two sets of uh, my introduction to this phenomenon. Can you describe them? Um, yeah, I can actually do better than that. I can show you two of the first drawings I did. Well, here's one. They kind of look like rock stars, which was, I'm quite into music, so they had this, they told me that music would be very important to the healing of humanity. Well, let me see if I could just get this out. I have my whole portfolio here so I can tell the story in pictures. Okay, here we go. So here's one of them. So if you can see that. Beam shift in the background there. Did you draw this? Yes, I did. Oh, you're uh, an excellent artist. Oh, thank you. It's very helpful when dealing with this kind of phenomenon. So I've, yeah, so I've been able to tell the whole story in pictures. And let me see. So that was probably that was probably Shamor. This would be this one coming up as Sahara. Now, this next one is quite interesting. There's two. Let's see. I haven't taken these out for quite some time, so it's kind of stuck. Oh, actually, it's really stuck. Let me just see if I can hold this up for you. Okay, can you see that guy? How's that? that? The other one? That is, that would be Zahara. Two fe both female. Well, they're androgynous. Their bodies just had, like, I could feel their auras, and they were very, um, very androgynous, very trendy for now, these days. Um... Their bodies were just like a form of light energy. So they're kind of what you, here's the other one, which I think looks, to me, looks more male. male. 
you kind of have to think of the 80s hair bands, right? What these guys look like. So, there, I got him. There you go. He's big. So, yeah, so that's the other one. Their, I, their skin is blue, so kind of that shade. Your, uh, your drawings are very nice. They're very descriptive. Oh, thank you. Thank you. They help. Those two, those last two portraits, interesting story on those. Do you remember Fred Bell? Did you ever know him? Fred Bell? Fred Bell. No. He, he was kind of popular. Oh, and then, well, when I was lecturing in the 90s, he was from California. And he was kind of, he fancied himself a musician and an inventor. He said he was part of the Alexander Graham Bell family and, excuse me, contactee and all this stuff. And he used to make pyramids and uh, pendants and stuff like that. Anyway, he, I found out, um, I showed him these drawings, in fact, he wanted photocopies of them, so I gave him photocopies, and I found out a couple of years later, he was telling people that he did the drawings, and he said they were Andromedans, and that's like, wait a second, that's what the heck, so, if anybody, yeah, so if anybody remembers Fred Bell showing drawings of Andromedans that he said he did, it's like, no. I have the originals right here. Um, anyway, I don't know why he did that. And of course, they never actually, they might have been as drama Indians, but they did not identify themselves to me as Andromedans. So I don't know. Give us their names again. Uh, Zahara and Shamor. Zahara and Shamor. Z with a Z hyphen H A R A and Shamor S H A apostrophe M O R. And um, they're androgynous. And Very much so. I, I kind of thought they weighted more towards male, male energy. But with a light body, like if you picture, like this is this is a recent little sketch of a blue being. They're always just like blue light. And I almost wonder if they gave me a face just because it made sense to me personally. I mean, perhaps they, they only exist as a light body, but for me, because I'd had this experience with not so nice looking extraterrestrial beings, it might have just been a show on their part. I don't know for sure. But other people have seen them actually, the um, Sixtopods Wells and the Mission Rama people uh, apparently had very similar contacts to mine. I've interviewed him. Uh, I don't know if it was Sixtopods, it wasn't Sixtopods, it was. One of his people. Giorgio? Uh, uh, I'd have to go back and look. It, he's the only one of their group that's uh, besides Sixtopias that speaks English. They're all Spanish speakers. So yes. He's, he's, he's an English speaker, or he's could able be, to speak English. Could be Giorgio. Giorgio Piacenza. So uh, what did, did they give themselves a name as far as, um, you know, like, like uh, we're we're you know they never said they were the Pleiadians, but did they ever no. say anything about who they were or where they no. came from or any of that stuff? No, no. and um, they said they kind of laughed. I said, "Where are you from?" And they said, "If it, it, what they said was imagine the furthest reaches of the universe, which is kind of hard to do," and they said, "That's where we're from. That's where you find us." And I thought, well. That's quite ambiguous, but again, that was, I think, a protection mechanism so that nobody I encountered at conferences or lectures could say, oh, they're Pleiadian, they're Andromedan, or because 
there's a lot of convoluted issues around the where they're from. And they said it wasn't even important. They said, and I think basically if this mothership, this great mothership called Galiziana does exist, that they're just in transit all the time. So if they have a home planet, um, I can't tell you where it is, but I can tell you that they do seem to exist on this gigantic mothership. It's almost like a Star Trek scenario. So, um, but they did tell me about the Council for New Atlantis, and they said I was to be in charge of the Council of New Atlantis, and they gave me the symbol for the New Atlantis. They gave me the title of commander, which sounds like, you know, it's like, oh, this kind of sounds like one of those narcissistic, you know, personality type contactees who says, oh, I'm in charge of this or something. But I try not, I try to keep my ego completely out of this. Um, if that's true, that, that's what I said. My story doesn't change. I mean, that's what I was told. You can go back through all my notes for the last 30 years, and I've never changed my story. So um, it's, it's strictly mine. It's strictly what I had downloaded, and it's not influenced by any of the other people that were in my field. So, so how long have you had uh, contact with them? Since 19... Eighty-nine, I guess, yeah, just before I left for Phoenix, because they, they kind of accelerated the, the whole process, like, you're going to go here, you're going to do this, you're going to close your business. I had to close my, I had to close my business, I had to leave my husband, I had to sell my car, uh, I told them I was leaving for three months, knowing that it was probably going to be much longer. Uh, turned out to be 20 years, um, although, you know, came back and forth, but still, um, yeah, and everything they said had come true. They said people who are important in the arts and music are going to show up, like, overnight, and this is going to be your new life. And, uh, yeah, it did happen really fast. Jim was involved with um, major bands and, and um, computer bots and uh, crazy stuff. And of course, Bill, he was one of the investigators on the Billy Meyer case. And he had all, he had an uh, incredible esoteric background. I mean, just very, very unusual character. He's pretty much gone dark these days, so it shows up occasionally. You're talking but, about your, uh, your husband? Ex-boyfriend. He was my, yeah. I had to leave my husband, my Vancouver-based husband, to embark on this new lifestyle. Um, but he was, as it turned out, he was, he was okay with it. So, um, yeah, it was just kind of this um, well planned trajectory that I didn't know about until those contacts started, but it happened pretty fast. And uh, you can see in my notes, like it just went from one item to the next. It was kind of like a proper business plan. And uh, that's so, how it ended up. So did you like your lifestyle change? My last what? Your lifestyle change when you went oh, from well, what you it was had to what you became did you enjoy the change or I did actually it was pretty exciting I kind of felt like I had really stepped into myself um advertising the advertising and film business was really hard um I had come out of several I was only 28 you know with an incorporated company and um we were kind of a boutique agency. We hired our contract help on a per project basis. So we didn't have staff per se, unless we had an active uh, project or an active photo shoot or film shoot. But, um, you know, the management of that is it's pretty intense. So my partner, Karen, had she had come from uh, 
a really well well known film production company and she was an award winning filmmaker, but she had chronic fatigue syndrome. So she was starting to lose energy and um, I was picking up the bulk of the work and I didn't have a lot of experience as a film producer. So I was juggling the advertising and the film and it was, and, and I had started, you know, getting these downloads and channels. And um, I actually started doing a series of huge paintings. I went, I was drawing Santa Fe. Someone, I heard someone say Santa Fe and all of a sudden I had to go pay a visit to Santa Fe. So that was part of the process. And I picked up Giorgio O'Keefe's biography and I came home from New Mexico and did 30 huge oil paintings in 30 days while running my business. And I opened up an art show and these paintings were just like very, very mystical. It was, I opened a show called Circles and Moons and it was just, um, uh, to this day, I think some of the best set of oil paintings I've ever done, just full on, you know, letter grip spiritual art but so, um, so you're a very artistic person i always have been yeah that's 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 been part of my life <laughs> since i could hold a pencil basically so i bet um, you i bet your um i bet your paintings sold for a lot of money each no, I never, you know, the problem was they probably would have had I stayed in Santa Fe. I spent a few months there and got into um, one of the Canyon Road galleries and I did sell paintings for sure. And my prices were starting to go up, but then I left and went back to Phoenix. I was invited back um, from Jim to go stay at the Flying Heart Ranch and I was told my my contacts told me that this is what was going to happen so I kind of had to give up Santa Fe and they wanted Santa Fe artists so part of my problem has been that you know because I've moved around so much and had different circumstances that I've never really been able to get you know stay and keep my foot in the door of the gallery so I got back into painting here in Salt Spring. It's kind of like Sedona, you know, it's a mecca of artists, but um, it's it's really hard to, you know, you need an agent now and you need to win at art shows and people hear like pictures of scenery and boats and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so what, so did, I, what, did, what did the uh, the beings tell you? What kind of messages did they give you? That, uh, it sounds like they were uh, very real. I mean, uh, you you hear all these different stories about different aliens, and there's never, the details are so vague on most of them, but your drawings are, say a lot. They really speak volumes. And so uh, what messages do you remember that they gave you that you're still in contact with them now, right? It's um, not, well, they kind of dropped off. This is another interesting aspect. They dropped off in the 90s as we were playing in the band and Jerry Wills and I are both contactees so on a very similar thread where the messages were you know, for the good of humanity and the good of the planet. We're not abductees like the, in the sense of, you know, people that have had these experiences taken up and experimented sure. with sure. and drop back. So we had uh, Jerry's hands-on healer. Um, I was taught that light, sound, and color can or heal the planet. You know, we're all about environment, music, energy, medicine, non-invasive medicine, I mean, the best that you could possibly imagine for humans. Um, Jim latched on to us pretty quickly well, at that first conference, and Jerry and I have been in discussions recently wondering if we were kind of monitored and handled so that we did not end up doing what we were supposed to do. 
we're still, uh, there's a number of events that kind of led up to this, including the state of the planet right now and the state of disclosure. So I'm, I'm talking about like a 30, 40 year gap in the timeline. But, um, but to bounce back to what they said was so important, first of all, and what hooked us both, especially what got my interest, and this is why I was uh, looking forward to this, you know, this lifestyle switch out of my office with my exhausted partner and deadlines. And, um, you know, we put in a couple of large bids on projects and we did not get the job. So it was, um, it was tough. We were going into our second year with about two two million in sales, pretty close. And, you know, even that was tough because we still didn't have quite enough to pay ourselves with. It was it was just hard. We could, I'm sure we could have pulled it through, but with Karen not having the energy, so we said, look, okay, this job and this job, if this job doesn't come through, I am going to follow the instructions of these beings that have been talking to me. And my partner went off to write feature film scripts. <laughs> so that was our agreement to close that business. And so sure enough, off I went. And um, they said one of the key messages, I, w I actually had a seven page speech that I hand wrote very quickly that was transmitted to me by those tall blue skinned beings that was um, well, I had no idea what it was for, but I had booked my flight to Phoenix and I was going to this conference in Phoenix to learn more about all this UFO stuff um, before I went on to Santa Fe. And um, so I had this speech in my hand and it was basically telling people that we were going to be facing environmental crises on this planet that people need to start to look after their own backyards or we would not have a backyard to look after. Um, and that was the that was the key part of the message, but they also said um, that music and light, and like I said earlier, is frequency medicine was designed to be able to heal the planet. The reason they could not bring the big ships in close and just fix us um, is because of our uh, lackadaisical issues with nuclear waste material. They said until your planet, your people have figured out to, how to transmute nuclear waste material into something safe and benign, we are staying away. And they wanted us contactees to deliver this message um, using the entertainment industry and especially music um, to kind of convey to people what they need to do to save the planet and save the humans and put humanity on this path to enlightenment and healing um, without even having to say to our audiences, hey, guess what? We're UFO contactees and this information came from these space guides and we're going to deliver this to you. I mean, we did a UFO conferences, of course, but I also took on the other issue they said was the prevention of substance abuse and um, preventing mental health issues amongst youth. So when I was in Scottsdale, I did uh, volunteer work for the Scottsdale Prevention Institute, the, the Governor's Alliance on Drug Policy, and the Scottsdale Alliance Against Drugs. And we actually used our band to deliver some of these messages to young people on the issues of substances and substance abuse um, uh, through our concerts. So it was like kind of cool. Here's our band called UFO. I mean, if anybody wanted to know why we were called UFO, we were happy to explain it. But my contacts, just like they said, 
never mind where we're from because we you know we don't want people obsessed with where we're from we want people more interested and affected by what you do with the information that we give you like what are you going to do about this what are you going to do with this information so i did I took action we had the, the band and that's kind of what we spoke about i mean jim was all about the new technology we had with village labs we had we had the newest um well we had the three ccd video cameras as soon as they came out we had the best and the newest uh, electronic music instruments we had contacts with major musicians like jim had worked with the moody blues um, so we met with them backstage whenever they came to Phoenix. He had originally come west with Toto. Um, he worked with Casablanca Records, which um, actually that was there that all the drugs started to come in too. So the Casablanca Records, there's uh, quite a story called The Hitman uh, about how bad the drugs were there and how they almost took out Polygram Records. But of course, that was prior to when I arrived. Jim had just moved from California back to Phoenix uh, when I met him and when Jerry also met him at that conference of Tim Backley's and that was September 1990. So it was all about like, here's this information, here's these important issues, here's how you can deliver the message, go do it. So that's what that was. So your band is no more. Uh, mm -hmm. What are you doing now these days? Well, Jerry, is doing his video podcast and interviews from a 42 foot diesel motor home that he drives all over the country. Mostly he stays parked like in Arizona, especially during the pandemic when they couldn't go anywhere. So he still interviews people and he does healings. He does private healings. So his website is jerrywills.com and he is, he's great. I mean, he is, his story hasn't changed. He's, still has most of his sense of humor intact, but um, we miss playing music. I mean, we miss getting together and doing our bass and drum jams. I mean, we really, we had a good time. The band came to a halt about somewhere between 96 and 98. Jim started to have some heart problems and he was having trouble playing in Village Labs. Oh gosh, that's just another story. His history with um, Jordi Hortmel, the financier of the lab. I mean, everything just kind of went south with the dot com and the tech business. And um, Jordi, Jordi was the one of the heirs to Hortmel Meats, and um, he was financing the lab. And that kind of uh, didn't work out so well. So between Jim's health and the uh, fact that we no longer had a practice space, um, that was kind of it. So yeah, we all went. So separately. what are you do? What are you doing now? Um, painting, <laughs> a teaching writing. I feel like I've kind of been you know, kicked back to a safe place, put in a holding pattern, uh, you know, keeping myself occupied until such time that we either get reactivated, which, you know, we're, we're, Jerry and I are very concerned about what's going on with the tyranny and obvious control. And it's kind of uh, and split that huge, huge divide, you know, that has been created among humans and how every time something enlightening and good, like the technology that could, you know, free the planet, free the humans, just seems to get co-opted by this dark side. And we'll call them the reptilians for lack of a better term. Um, I, I was friends with uh, Malou Zeitlin 
I don't know if you've ever heard of the Zeitlins. They both passed away, but um, Jerry Zeitlin, her husband, was a physicist in Malou, had worked for um, George H.W. Bush in the war room. She actually brought technology, uh, nanotechnology to the U.S. government. Her plans were to be there for the first trips to Mars, and um, they founded Open SETI. So Malou became like my best buddy in Sedona, and uh, we used to have coffee once a week, and so she kind of told me how things work with the U.S. government, and she told me that they are just basically reptilians that just keep coming back and playing the same stupid, nasty games with people over and over again. And she said, especially regarding the disclosure movement, she said the tall whites are in charge. And, you know, uh, what, what do I know? It's like, okay. Um, she had many deep reasons for believing that and and it was I couldn't argue with her she was I mean such an intellect that often went over my head as she spoke about different warring factions out there in the ethers and um, anyway if you want to learn more about the tall whites you just look up Charles Hall at the tall whites and he did do a there's a short documentary I'm familiar uh, with him yeah so they have apparently been in charge of, well, let's just say that third tier and the top levels of military that even presidents may or may not be privileged to. So with all of the crazy stuff that's happened with COVID like and the messaging, the absolutely bizarre Orwellian, you know, black is white, white is black, ups, down, down, it's up, like all the strange twists that have happened since then. And then to find out that the uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies were contracted with the Department of Defense, and that the Department of Defense, if they really are under the influence of these tall whites, then we're in trouble. This is, you know, this is really the end game that has been conveyed to us through the last 30, 40 years of transmissions. And Jerry and I are sitting here and going, well, heck, were we co-opted? Because we were supposed to stop this. This wasn't supposed to happen. And did we, you know, did we miss something here? Or are we waiting for the final sprint to the finish line? Uh, before we're called back to service, we're, we're not sure. So, and I know for sure that the Mission Rama people are questioning the same thing. In fact, we were hoping um, Renato, Renato Legato, I think, Legato, he's an author. Um, anyway, he was very big with the Mission Rama, and he has stopped talking about anything to do with UFOs. I was hoping he would talk to Jerry and I, and he won't. But uh, I had contact with him through this other person um, who I connected with on Daniel Pinchbeck. Are you familiar with Daniel's work? He's an yeah, author. I am, yes. Okay, so I've taken workshops with Daniel. We've had, you know, many conversations. You know, it's my story. Um, so this other fellow, uh, I think his name was Chris, had posted something on one of Daniel's um, substacks, and so we got in touch, and I told him what Jerry and I were dealing with, and he's a friend of Renato's, and I said, well, I think Renato would talk to us, and he, he won't. So he said that he did tell me that the Mission Rama people are also questioning who and what they were in contact with. So that kind of puts all of us contactees of these, you know, the recipients of these benevolent messages uh, 
kind of between a rock and a hard place right now because we don't know if there's more action to be taken or if we were taken out of service at a really inopportune time for us, at an opportune time for the tall whites or whoever is driving the DOD and the DARPA agenda. And what the heck are they trying to do? Well, for all intents and purposes, it looks to me like they are trying to turn humans into this, into these guys. This, which is what the abductees said, that those, those beings that abducted them were us in the future. And I'm starting, I'm seeing like kids walking around now who are, of course, they've been masked for two years and they're, you know, so they've got these eyes, these sort of blank, terrified looking eyes, and they are very pale and they're very thin and they just don't seem well. And of course, they're completely addicted to tech technology and obviously highly programmable. And so it's kind of horrifying to see this happen and to see things like art and music and everything kind of starting to degrade quickly. So it seems to me like we're at a very critical turning point for, for all of this right now. So have you gotten any messages recently from your uh, contacts? Yeah, kind of. Um, not quite, not to the degree that I like, <laughs> I keep asking, like, just, just please give me actual instructions, you know. Um, I get a lot of hits, like, especially just one part of this house, which is, you know, normal. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of First Nations burial grounds and a lot of dark light energy around here. So I can, really, there's only a couple of spots, even in this house, which is in the forest, and it's very close to some of these intense battleground areas. So I have to be very clear and very aware. But when I'm in this one part, I do get, I'm getting a lot of, I would just call psychic hits, like brief, you know, messages uh, that do seem to be true and it's kind of um, it's a little bit different spin on what you're going to hear in the news but the news isn't the news anymore it's um, it's all uh, well it's like the dark and the light side playing with the chessboard and the chess pieces are very very high tech you know it's the same old game that's been happening for millennia, but they have these very high tech tools now. Um, so things happen really fast. Uh, what they are saying is just um, ignore, ignore anything in the media. They're saying everything, everything is being manipulated right now. You have to trust your gut instincts. If you're interested in a subject, cross-reference it to depth, but do not believe anything that's coming from any government, coming through any media source. Um, and it's just gotten, I think a lot of people already know that, but it's, it's gotten worse. Um, what we're looking at, I'm, I'm still trying to get a handle on this timeline, this end the games and it's like, what are they doing and how fast they're doing it? And I really think they are pushing this human 2.0, this genderless, uh, pale, whitish thin being that cannot reproduce, that has zero sense of humor, um, basically, like it's an artificial intelligence life form, but they're transmuting a whole bunch of humans, especially younger humans. I would say probably teens to early 20s right now. Um, and that is the demographic that we need if we're going to like go with our plan, which was to use music, light, you know, sound, color to create this 
beautiful enlightenment of humanity, um, you know, let's say very or organic and healthy food. I mean, look what they're trying to do. They're trying to <clears throat> force people to uh, eat artificial food, take one mRNA shot after the other, and just keep doing it. You're on that course for a lifetime now. They are transmuting people right in front of us in real time. So I, I've kind of been going back into notes and looking at old stuff and I'm going, all I can say is that uh, things are going, like they set up several scenarios when I was, you know, 20 and 20s first dealing with this, this one. And Rudolf Steiner's work kind of follows this trajectory, too. It's like, if these beings get a foothold and this happens, then this timeline is going to happen. Not good. Not good for humans. But my context said these, you know, these rock and roll type guys said, we will win in the end. And I'm like, well, it seems awfully close to the end, you know. We're in a marathon, are we down to the final 100 meter sprint? And it's, are we going to win? I I don't know. They're pushing very hard to get this through quickly. It's like, you know, you probably heard of Agenda 2030. Oh, they're speeding it up because they've been found out. They know that we see them, which is, you know, part of their problem right now. Well, it's their problem um, for their agenda, but it's good for ours. So that's that's just kind of, that's all I'm getting. I wish I was getting a lot more, you know, but I'm not. So it could be for protection purposes too. That's all I can think of. Well, so. I Almost have run out of questions. Do you have uh, any other any other experiences or things you want to talk about before we leave? I mean, we uh, sure. Well, you know, I was trained in light therapy, and it's you know, it's absolutely heartbreaking for me to watch people suffer, like through this, the last few years. It's just absolutely ridiculous and I know people have all have their own perspectives but let's just say with energy medicine with light um, we can keep people healthy we have the technology to not have to panic if there's a virus or send people to hospitals or you know we can do regenerative medicine everything we actually need for that scenario exists in fact people like jerry uh, who does the hands-on healing are really busy he's really busy but he's seen a lot of people with uh, very sick and uh, unusual symptoms, neurological symptoms, um, of course, heart problems are, are huge, turbo cancers, everything is, you know, it's really quite awful to, to witness how far they've been able to go with their keep people sick so we can make billions of dollars agenda. Um, the only reason that might have happened is, you know, to make people aware. I mean, I see more people um, gravitating towards energy medicine and wellness, but at the same time, they are trying really, really hard to shut it down. I mean, just the other day, MSNBC came up with this absolutely bizarre article claiming that exercise is now far right. And so they love to use because, you know, the American story is really kind of the you know, Cinderella story of the planet. Everybody looks to the states. Or, and uh, but so far left and far right. And of course, some of us are like, what do you mean far left, far right? <laughs> but um, 
that's what they're calling exercising. And I'm like, well, I'll just inform my, you know, very uh, media sucked in liberal conservative. All my friends who run are suddenly, you know, far right. Like that's the furthest thing that they would consider themselves. And it's like, okay, let's just mix everybody up. So they're they're deliberately confusing people. And that's why I say, like, okay, that's it with media, mainstream, done. Um, but uh, I have started doing, what I'm doing is, is more through animals. And I'm, my, I'm getting more information, which is very grounding through animals, because technology, while it can affect them, in, you know, their food and their health care and stuff, they're still animals. So I've started doing orographs, these drawings of what the animal sees and different trajectory through an animal. So I'll show you the one I just completed for a friend of mine who happens to be a Berkeley educated psychic and her husband is Alfred Weber. Have you, do you know Alfred? He's yes, I'm familiar with Alfred. Yeah, so this sort is sort of, I mean, I'm, I, I know, I know who he is. I mean, I, yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah. Go he ahead. Show, show what you want to show. So this is the orograph for their cat. So I'm, I'm learning this technique through Joseph Scheel, who is a world-renowned psychic medium. So this is their the story of their cat. The cat is deceased. So um, he, he met his demise with a coyote, unfortunately. But it's um, what the animal sees are the portal through around and back out through the different dimensions. So there are such good teachers for us for uh, how to exist on this plane and how to work with it. He's the coyote that finally got him in the end. The way he describes it is that he became one with the coyote. So. That's how animals think of their end. So all of the stories that we tell ourselves about, you know, the ETs and the state of the planet and all this stuff and everything, it still comes back to who are we with nature? What is, you know, the animals see all the green or eat, of course, you know, I live in a very green place, but Green is the color of the heart chakra. It's the color of this world, and it's the color of the afterworld for them. So it goes full circle. Love, life, heart, it's all the same. This dimension, the other dimension. So a lot of our staying grounded and healing, uh, even with all the chaos that's happening, all the strangeness, uh, you can't take that sense of connection to nature away from us. Our heart chakras are always going to be green. Our base chakra is always going to be red. And that is not going to change. So no matter what affects us uh, outwardly, um, our spiritual life can stay the same if we think about those connections and keep grounded. Blue, you know, these beings, these friendly, benevolent beings have blue skin, kind of like Vishnu. Their eyes are gold, which is, an, you know, the combination of gold and blue has deep spiritual meaning too. So blue, of course, throat chakra, indigo, the third eye. So when we think in color and colors, and the symbols, like for people, I do kind of recommend, you know, if, if you're feeling um, pulled in too many directions, you can't make any sense of what's going on with the planet right now to pick up something, anything, a color, like with colors, and just 
draw uh, scribbles just to start just do lines and shapes and I'll show you basically an abstract here so you just just start scribbling you don't have to be an artist you just and then start to put it aside and then see if you see shapes and you can read for yourself like this is I see this and it's like oh this is you know a sad part of my life that I see something that looks like it might be a brighter color or better time and so the the orographs I think even though I'm doing them through the animal's eyes I think they're important for people to do here's another one that's just an abstract and what you're doing is you're kind of teaching yourself uh, a new language and possibly a language that comes through from the angelic realms or from these benevolent ETs because that light color sound and aroma, if you're into aromatherapy, floral sense or sense of angels, stay in touch with that because these other entities I really think they are moving towards this different type of artificial intelligence based human that has no color no humor no music it's all just like if you've ever heard Yuval Harari speak he says he's calling humans hackable animals and it's like my contacts never wanted anything to get this far but perhaps they had either we're st like I said Jerry and I are still trying to figure this out we don't know if our plan got hijacked or if we're just you know gonna be wielding our swords <laughs> to the last and drumsticks and guitars to the very last second um, to win this battle of light and dark because that's what it is so yeah it's about all I have to say <laughs> Well, um, it was a pleasure talking with you, and I, I liked seeing your contact, uh, the beings your contact in contact with. Uh, Thank you. It was nice to see their images, to see, you know, uh, when you, when they contacted you, um, how did you experience them, you know, when they were in your presence? What what uh how did you how did give us a sense of how that played out well uh, to be able to get these drawings what they did is they presented as if you uh for anyone who if you've had therapeutic touch training or um for anyone who can feel auras like if you you know you can bring energy up and feel it sure the hand. it's like a solid wall like it's just as it's as solid as touching someone so right. they let me do that they would you know after meditation they said okay here we are come up and just feel so i got to feel their uh auras and their shape um the details in the faces came through in meditation so it was like if i were doing a portrait of you i could sit there and draw um and so what did uh what did you feel when you felt their aura go back through that experience and explain mm -hmm. explain it like you were there right now doing doing that experience well like i could i was standing up and and they were standing side by side this was a room in that house that i was uh, renting with some a uh, couple of other friends and so I could feel that one was, you know, about six foot eight, like huge, which Jerry was six foot eight, so it's kind of, but I didn't, had, hadn't met him at the time. And uh, the other one was taller, so really huge. So I'm reaching up, you know, quite high, because <laughs> I'm five foot six. I'm going, oh, well, that's interesting. And then just coming down the bodies. And of course, there's, you know, you can't, like I said, they're very androgynous, so it's like they're wearing almost, a, it's like this, this light body, it's like I'm not feeling like any specific body parts or anything, but more like a sheath of, um, well, like this drawing, you know, this painting. So, oops, 
it when it that one. So yeah. that's, you know, so it's just like, okay, so that's the androgynous part, I guess. So that was the probably first time. So it, and then I made, this is actually remade, this little sculpture, just the head. So when I was in, they have elongated skulls too. So I wanted a 3D version. So this is just a little clay figure. But um, when I lived in Phoenix, I made a clay head that I used for model, a model that I did some later paintings of them too. So. So, so when you were feeling their auras, um, did you get any, I mean, what were you experiencing when your hands were feeling the auras? Were you getting emotions or uh, mental images or what, what exactly uh, did you well, the, experience? The mental, yeah, the mental image. It was like if, if I were doing it for a person, which, and by that point I was trained to do it for people. I was trained to do aura cleansing. Um, which is like a therapeutic touch, right? So, so your hand is about here, from the wherever you find the the edge of the person's sore. It's about an inch or two. Like you know, people can radiate way out here, but for therapeutic touch and healing, you're you're about here, and then you just run your hands over that edge of what you find, and you get the shape. Oh, it's very healing for for people and animals too. Horses, absolutely. Do you, do you remember when you did that with the with your being with the aliens you were con the light beings you were in contact with? Do you mm -hmm. remember the actual event of putting your hands? Uh, yeah. Okay, so were you getting uh, mental images, emotions? What were you receiving when you did that? Yeah, I was getting um, yeah the mental. I was, it was quite. Quite a happy time, so it's like, oh, there you are. <laughs> and I think I was listening. I'd been listening to uh, one of uh, David Bowie type too, and of course Bowie was quite involved with extraterrestrials. So I thought it was really cool that the music seemed to be connected to them saying, "Okay, come on over here." It was like, I I think I had had I'd have to check my early notes, but I think I had had some inkling, you know, of what they looked like prior to that. But um, so the, I had a very good men mental picture that um, that that was them, which I thought was pretty cool. It was just were you, were you getting were you getting positive emotion? What what kind oh, of absolutely. what kind of sense of being what kind of energy in your mind, your emotions, your mental yeah. images, what, what were you receiving when you put your hands near the beings? Oh, very, very benevolent, like, you know, and absolutely no uh, problems or issues. Like when, you know, when you do this for a human, you're going to find like dark spots or hollow spots or cords or things within that, the human's aura. Well, with these guys, there was nothing like that. It was, you know, pretty smooth sailing all the way down. So it was surreal. It was almost like like a two-way exchange, like healing exchange. So I'm feeling that I'm going, wow, this is nice. I kind of like this, you know. So they're probably, you know, radiating that healing, benevolent healing energy back to me as much as I was, you know, just, you know, feeling for for the shape of of them and they were you know they're very helpful with recommendations and you know the advice little demonstrations that they'd send me on or people you say you're gonna walk in this store and meet a so-and-so and i'm like okay <laughs> so so they were giving you a sense of your trust. future yeah definitely a sense of the future very trustworthy. Um, and you were getting which, positive vibes from them. hundred percent. Yep. The only thing, um, well, they did say when when they started to talk about the Southwest and, and uh, there was uh, a little bit of uh, your safety will be assured. 
And it, that sounded a little bit ominous to me. I thought safety, safety from what? Like, why does my safety need to be assured? <laughs> so, yeah, a couple, couple of little warning times, but I'm very, very, um, I felt very protective, very confident. You know, it was like all because all of this was new to me. So it was pretty strange to be, you know, so so confident, like absolutely no doubt that the steps that I was following, thanks to them, were the correct steps to take. So uh, is there anything else you want to tell the audience before we finish the conversation? Um, nothing I can really think of. Maybe but... like, you know, uh, how to get it if, if if somebody wanted to contact you for whatever reason and you want to give any type of contact information, is that something you're open yeah, to? Yeah, sure, sure. But um, uh, I, I'm not much help to abductees, but if people uh, need encouragement that their, uh, their music, their art is it's helping humanity, or if they are animal people or horse people, I'm a professional question. I, I get, um, I help people with their horses a lot by communicating with the horses, uh, doing remote conversations. And so uh, you're an, you're an animal communicator. Yeah. Yeah. I get a lot of information from animals. And besides that, I am actually a professional trainer. So uh, it, it's not just that I get information, but I can um, correlate it with my practical experience too. So, if, you know, if a horse says, like the last horse I worked with said that he sees prey from an ancient time and he sees through dimensions and he sees through the veils and when he sees these things, he startles and he blows up and uh, he stumped his owner a few times. And um, who and she feels like she has an ancient connection, old old connection with this horse. And I said, "Well, you're going to have to be 100% focused with him because he sees things and he doesn't understand why you don't see them. And he reacts. And if you're a split second too slow, he's going to blow up and possibly injure or, or dump you." And I said, so you're going to have to be very aware. And as soon as he sends you a signal, just be prepared to get off or just don't get on him in the first place. So um, she's had a better relationship with him since. Um, I should probably go see him in person. But I do this a lot for a lot of horses, too. And people are, you know, welcome to correlate with their trainer or their veterinarian. I actually prefer that people, if I find something an issue with the horse that they do actually consult with the veterinarian if it's a veterinary issue. But um, yeah, so I can help people that way. So and, if people wanted to get in touch with you, how would they get in touch with you? Okay, the best email address is, uh, let's see, we used UFO. Um, for most contacts, I would prefer susan.greenpony, that's all one word, at gmail.com. I can put that in the chat for you. Uh, Susan dot yeah. green pony dot green pony at gmail dot com. There we go. Susan yep. dot green pony at gmail dot com. That's it. it. Yep. All right. Is there anything else you want to tell the audience before we end this? I think that's it. I hope everybody has the chance to benevolent in contact with something and uh, stay creative. Stay if you want to stay healthy. Uh, don't eat that fake food stuff. Um, source your water well. Source all of your food, and whether you're vegan, vegetarian, or meat eater. Just make sure it's real food, clean food. Um, Keep playing music if that's what you do and find your community. You know, people need people. We can't afford to be isolated from the people that uh, that we like to be around. So, yeah, that's, well, that's my recommendation. 
It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, thank, thank you, you for Mike. introducing us, introducing everyone to your, to these being androgynous beings that are uh, been very positive for you. Yeah. And, uh, let me go ahead and end this now. Great. Thank you, Mike. Great talking to Thanks you. Thanks for coming you. out, Susan. Okay. You take care. You too.